Yeah, I try to train like Monday to Friday, sometimes Saturday. So I do train five or she six days hard, a week. She goes hard, this girl. I lift a lot. Yeah. I might be little. She's but strong. I've seen <laughs> it. I'm like, what? <laughs> On today's episode, we have Caroline Groth, a certified integrative health coach. We chat all about weight training, how to find friends when you've moved from another country, and her journey with disordered eating. This is a really insightful and deep episode, and I can't wait for you all to listen. Welcome back to another episode of Self Done Beautiful Humans, a safe place to learn and get inspired to live your healthiest and most fulfilling life. I am Dom, your host, and I feel so grateful to be living my passion by getting to interview inspiring and knowledgeable guests. Today's guest is Caroline Groth, a certified integrative health coach. I've been following you for such a long time, the early days of Instagram. I've seen your journey with food and mindset, and I love seeing how you inspire other women. You share incredible gut healthy recipes that are easy and simple to make. You're a yogi, an exercise enthusiast, as well as a mental health advocate. I always share how important it is to follow people on social that bring you joy, and you are certainly that. So welcome to the podcast, Caroline. Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. Thank oh, you. No, what a compliment. Of I appreciate so, that a lot. We see each other most mornings on our walk. Yeah. On the promenade. And I saw you and I was like, I need to get her on the podcast. <laughs> so when you said yes, I was so stoked. Oh my God, of course. I was so honored to come on here. You are a wealth of knowledge. So I'm excited to dig into your brain. So I wanted to start off by learning about your journey. Mm. How did you get into the wellness space? Yeah, God, it's been like quite the journey and quite long. We've got I'm, time. <laughs> good. I'm like always saying, oh, I'll make a long story short and it kind of ends up being just a long story long. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely a talker. Um, look, I kind of got into the health and wellness kind of journey because I got sick quite a few years ago now, probably about, God, what are we in, 2024? About 12, 13 years ago, I had a really kind of life altering um, time in my life where I got really sick and it really um, showed me how much I needed to start looking after myself, not just from a physical perspective, but also a mental and emotional kind of level. And that was kind of the beginning of the end in some sort of way of just the unraveling of so much stuff that I've been stuffing down my entire life. And at that point I was about 22 or 23 when my journey kind of began and I'm 34 now turning 35 this year. So it's been a really long journey of getting to know myself on a really deep level and understanding how everything is intertwined and everything relates to one another. So I could, that was kind of how my wellness and health journey started, but it also was kind of because I didn't really have any other option if I wanted to feel good. And I live with a few autoimmune diseases as well that I've been diagnosed with progressively kind of like in my 20s and my early 30s as well. So, you know, I've always kind of said that with each diagnosis that I had, I always promised myself that I would accept it, but I wouldn't let it dictate how I was living my life. So I always wanted to live a quote unquote normal life, whatever normal is. Um, So I didn't want to let it hold me back. And that meant that I had to look at my lifestyle and everything that I'm doing in order to live as normally as I could or as I can. And that kind of is my health journey and it's still going and it's never ending. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen on your Instagram, as I said, I've been following you for such a long time and you've been vulnerable and honest to your audience about your history with disordered eating. So I did want to touch on that. I also want to preface a trigger warning to the audience. So feel free to forward ahead. What really helped you create a better relationship with food and movement? Oh God, that's also been such a long journey and being completely honest, it I know and I've accepted that it will always be an ongoing journey for me. Um, it has been such a big part of my life from such a young age, ever since I can kind of remember I had stuff around my body and how 
my body felt and how I felt in my body and how I viewed my body. And I just always felt different from like a really young age. And I don't mean I felt different in terms of I physically looked different. There was just an innate feeling of always feeling like I never fit in. I felt different. I felt misunderstood. I didn't feel seen and so on. And so I think a lot of those kind of issues like transferred into, you know, my teenage years and then my adolescence and like my early adulthood and then adult as well. But I think one of the biggest things for me that have helped me improve and that continues to help me improve my relationship to food and to movement is the continuous journey of coming more and more back to myself. And I know that always sounds a bit wishy-washy because how do you kind of do that, right? But the more that I create a level of connection with my true self deep on the inside, uh, void of anything that's aesthetic or exterior, the more I can see things for exactly what they are. And so for me, that means that you know, I'm a Vedic meditator. I've been doing Vedic meditation for probably about seven or eight years now religiously. Um, every morning, try most afternoons, but <laughs> life happens and I'm busy and I work. Uh, but every morning upon waking, you know, I meditate for 20 minutes. Um, I go on my walks in the morning with my girlfriends. I train and I move my body, but in a way that I do it for me to feel good on the inside, to be healthy, to manage my autoimmune diseases, not with the key focus of I must do this because I must look a certain way. And don't get me wrong, I definitely still fall into that aspect and that doesn't mean that I don't want to look pretty and I don't want to feel beautiful and I don't want to, you know, look a a way that I find myself beautiful Um, But it is continuing to catching myself of every time I do, not every time I do something, but it's more ingrained in me now that I don't need to focus so much, much on it. But it's that thing of where is this coming from and why am I doing it? Is it being ego driven or is it being driven by my true self that's actually going to benefit me in the end? So I think just practice this continuously that can drive more self-awareness and connection to myself makes it easier to make good decisions for myself that's going to benefit me long term. Yeah, I resonated with what you said. I'm also a Vedic meditator. Mm. Um, Say my boyfriend is religious twice a day. He can meditate for hours. I'm like 20 minutes, that's it, in the morning. (laughs) And when when we're on holidays, we do the two together. But that inner awareness it allows me to catch myself when the thoughts of, am I going to go do crazy cardio session to look a certain way because I've got some photo shoot or that mind game that plays, or am I actually going to tone it back and just go for a walk because my cortisol's high and just listen yeah. to my body. And that awareness that comes with meditation has such a flow on effect to everything in your life. So I agree starting your day with that, it just gives you, ability to be in tune with yourself and as I've said I've followed you and your journey I remember seeing you at powerliving yoga and you you know you're just this yogi girl (laughs) and I'd see what the markets we didn't know who each other were but yeah I've really seen you flourish and grow and it is so nice to hear you speak about it in such a positive way thank you and a lot of the guests, well, majority of the guests, it's, you know, you hit that rock bottom phase and then mm. you can soar and flourish and, yeah. you know, you're just the perfect example yeah. of that. So yeah. thank you for sharing that. with Oh, no, that's okay. I also wanted to actually add, I think one of the big things that's potentially a bit more kind of graspable or like actionable is that what I've found for me is that I think there's two parts to it. And again, this is why the journey is always continuous because I'm uncovering more and more that's making me understand why I was and am the way that I am. And I know that for me and the people that I talk to, if we really start uncovering things, it's the same root issue that is driving the behaviour. And it really is that there is unprocessed trauma there somewhere in which you are utilising food or a substance to um, 
take away the pain essentially, right? So that you don't have to focus on what's going on inside of you. You don't have to sit with it. You don't have to feel it. And it's this thing of not wanting to feel your emotions, but when emotions get stuck in the body, it's creating creating like a trauma response because emotions is energy in motion. And if it gets stuck, you're not in a flow state, right? Where it's just like flowing through you. And, but then there's also the other part to it where it's absolutely, I think, an emotional a trauma response. However, if it's been going on for like a really long period of time throughout your life, it also starts becoming like a physical response. And now it's like kind of double whammy and a double product uh, problem where you do have to um, acknowledge both sides of it. So I'm not really, um, I'm not a big fan of those people that says, oh, you know, disordered eating is only this or it's only this. I don't think that's true. I think it's a combined thing of a lot of things and you need to approach it with a really holistic view. So that means, you know, managing your emotions, processing trauma, but it also means taking care of your physical body because if you've been starving yourself um, for a really long time, your body is like void of like nutrients, right? So then you also start having chemical imbalances, which also then drives your behavior, even if you do want to stop. So there's a lot of things that come into play here, right, that you want to like think about and start looking at. And I know that can sound really overwhelming and you don't have to do all at once, but I do think it's it's not just one solution to the problem. It's about, you know, taking care of yourself across the board. Yeah. I wanted to jump into the next question because I feel like it rolls nicely from there is I know for myself – when you kind of have that penny drop moment, you something's not right, mm. and then the way you approach food and exercise, how did you kind of shift your mindset to go to the gym or go to your yoga class and go to sh- go as an act of self love yeah. rather than an act of, I guess, self hate yeah. to yourself? For me, it was. Um, I think it's different for everyone, right? Like some will literally have that day where it's the penny drops and you just change instantly and for others it's a journey and I think for me it was definitely something that took like a really long time and it was about improving day by day so but when I really had like a really big moment of actually acknowledging to myself first and foremost that I had a problem like I knew that I had a problem but I wasn't really it's it's this strange way of like knowing that you you are very sick but you won't really be fully honest with yourself and it was literally my girlfriend my best girlfriend pulled me up on the street and this is like god like nine eight or nine years ago or something pulled me up on the street and she was just like I'm not doing this anymore and I was very confused about what she was talking about and she was like I'm not just letting you watch I'm not just sitting here and watching you literally kill yourself like slowly, right? You're getting smaller and smaller. And I just remember getting so angry. It was in the middle of the street of Bondi, just rushing home and she came after me. And I think I locked myself into the room for like two days, just crying hysterically like a child, (laughs) throwing a tantrum because I was so angry. And then she was just like, are you ready to talk? And I just remember saying to her, like, it feels like I'm dying every single day. And then I go to bed at night and then I wake up only to relive the same nightmare every single day. But it was like a really moment for me where I was like, wow, my best girlfriend loves me enough to have a really, really hard conversation with me that no one else around me had had saying that they love me. And I understand it's really hard and it's a really confronting topic, but I think if you really love someone, you want the best for them and you're not just going to let them wither away and and look at the kind of issues that they're having and not doing anything. So for me, even though it was a really hard and rough moment, I don't know if I would have necessarily maybe been here today if she hadn't had the courage to give me some tough love that I needed yeah yeah I had a similar um circumstance where my friends all just 
told the counsellor at the school, like, yeah. she's not okay and I think I want to talk about your tribe and finding your people because it can really change the trajectory of your life tenfold. Yeah. Obviously, you've come here from Denmark yeah. and I want to talk about your experience finding your tribe. As I mentioned, I did a walk club and all the girls that came were from England, Mongolia, all around, and they're so eager to find these communities. So I want to yeah. know, how did you find your tribe in Sydney? Yeah, it's funny because it's actually quite a common question that I get in my DMs on Instagram as well. It shows that, like, it's such a big thing that people don't talk about. They don't know how to do it. No one teaches you how to find people. No, 100%. And I definitely think it also, no one talks about how hard it is to establish friendships, especially in your adulthood. It's different when we're younger. But then I also look back at even just something as simple as, like, going to school, right? You get put in a classroom with what? 25 or 30 kids and then they're like oh you be friends and so we're just friends but we don't actually know if we've got anything in common (laughs) which is why I think a lot of people grow apart because maybe you never really had something that was meant to be together right but I think moving to Sydney it's definitely a hard place I'm not going to sugarcoat it it's a really hard place to make friends it's very cliquey people are not necessarily very open to meeting new people, uh, creating new friendships. Um, yeah, it's very hard. But so for me, I think, look, I've almost lived in Australia for, in Sydney for, and Bondi, for almost 14 years. You and are a local now. <laughs> you are, I've said it. I'm part of the furniture right now. Um, it's a lot of the people that I knew when I first moved here because I was it was literally a few weeks before I turned 21 when I moved here. <gasps> I know. Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I've got two friends from then or something yeah. like that. So I think, you know, you obviously change a lot. I think your 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 20s are really the time where you find yourself as well and figure out who you actually are. Um, so I don't have a lot of those friends left because we probably never really had the foundation and I've changed so much in those years. So for me, the tribe that I have now, it's... Honestly, it's been through, what have it been through? It's honestly been through like people of people. Obviously the kind of work that I do and the job that I do does expose me to a lot of different people. Mm. And I also feel like I'm very lucky to be in health and wellness because I find that the people that are kind of in this category on this industry tend to be more open to wanting to connect with other people and actually have deeper, more genuine conversations about things that are really important in life as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's a connection point in that. And so bringing that kind of offline from work as well and establishing um, friendships outside of that. But besides than that, I've met so many people going to the gym when I changed over to 98 um, I feel like you're like their spokesperson. <laughs> I always see you there. I'm like, she is going for it. Chris will love this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so funny. People are like, oh, so will message me about questions. Like, you do know that I don't work there, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then I'm also like, but here's all the info. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I love it. Honestly, it has absolutely changed my life going there fully, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, like all of the above. Mm-hmm. So I feel very grateful Um having that introduced into my life. So I've made a lot of really great friends there. Again, it's, I think you've got to try to think about it and people that are coming here is going to places that where there's people that have got the same interests as you, right? And it does sound a bit kind of cliche, but it's true. Like we talked about before this thing about if you're dating and you feel like you must go out to meet someone and you're thinking, well, where do I have to go? Oh, I have to drag myself out at nine. I have to go to a club or a, a bar or whatever. It's not really me, but it's the only place I'll meet men. Well, if you think about it in this way of why are you putting yourself in a situation or an environment that's not actually a reflection of who you are? So that means that you are going to meet someone that isn't actually seeing you for who you truly are, which means that you're creating an idea of who you are to someone else. And then that's the foundation you're starting something on. So if you immerse yourself in environments where there's people you know is likely to have the same interests as you, there's always going to be a talking point, right? And 
I think you also just got to be a bit, um, you got to be willing to step outside of your comfort zone to make new friends. Yeah. That's the thing. You got to start getting comfortable with rejection. Uh, and it's not rejection, it's just redirection, right? And I'm going like to give people. you, well, I'm going to give you the other perspective, which is I'm someone who's lived here my whole life. I'm someone who has like my click, I guess, here. Mm. And I've met people who have traveled at Pilates classes and they'll message me, do you want to get a much after yeah. or whatever? But I'll say no at first. Yeah. But then I'll see them again at a Pilates class and then, you know, we'll have a bit of a chat and I'll be like, oh, this girl actually has substance and then we'll get a matcha. Yeah. So sometimes it takes a few times of like touch points before yeah. the person says, okay, let's hang out. Yeah. So just because someone says no the first time, don't look at it as like, oh, we're never going to be friends. Yeah. Remember, the person you want to hang out with, they've already maybe got a group of friends, they might have a boyfriend, they're busy. Yeah. So you know, it's going to take a few times for them to say yes. They want to get to know you a little bit before they commit to an hour of hanging out. Yeah. So as someone who lives here and I have so many friends from all over the globe who live here now, it sometimes takes a few times yeah. before you say yes to yeah. hanging out with them. Don't look at it as rejection. Yeah. And or, you know, you don't go to the gym once and make your whole best friend click. I know. You've got yeah. to go consecutively. First of all, get you to the gym. Amazing. Yeah. And second of all, <laughs> you know, you see that familiar face three, four times, okay, yeah, let's hang out, you know, let's get a smoothie after this yeah. gym session. It's so it's it's not easy to make friends, but as Caroline said, you've got to put yourself out there yeah. and you've almost got to manifest it. Like yeah. walk in there in with that energy of attraction. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think it's so important. Oh, 100%. Like you've got to be positive and everything as well, right? I also think it's – I think sometimes society have also – created this idea in our heads that we must have a huge group of friends because otherwise we're not accomplished or like we're not deemed successful in the kind of friend group or like friend kind of arena and I personally would rather have five really like really really close friends than having 100 people that I just couldn't count on. No, absolutely. You know? So I think sometimes going with the mindset also of like quality over quantity absolutely yeah and I think it's a thing that happens as you get older I think a lot of the listeners are a bit younger and they want to feel cool and mm. accepted but I truly believe as you get older for me I had like a penny drop moment again where I was out for dinner and the conversation was so surface level with people who I thought were my friends yeah and I was like these aren't my people yeah. I actually <laughs> would rather hang out with Crumble and Tom on the yeah. couch or my best friend Sash from high school and have a good conversation over a tea then be out for the sake of being out. Exactly. And I know it happens to all of us where you're in that nightclub and you're like, wait, why am I here? Yeah. Like, how did I get here? And, you know, you've got to have those moments. You've got to realise for yourself. It's yeah. not good enough for us to tell you qual quantity, quality over quantity. Quality over quantity, yeah. But, yeah, you will have those realisations yeah. and... It's your sign to just nurture those people in your life yeah. and grow with them. It, and it's also okay if you guys grow apart. Because exactly. as you yeah. said, in your 20s, you're ever changing. Yeah. So you've got to make sure that the network around you supports you and encourages you. And, yeah. you know, you kind of need to do a little stock take on your friends sometimes. Oh, 100%. Yeah, just make absolutely. sure they're the people you want. Yeah. I wanted to touch on training. Um, 98 Gym, you go to a lot. I, as I said, I knew you when you were a big yogi. I mm. saw your pal living all the time. I also, I was yoga every day, yeah. never lifted a weight. Yeah. Um, what is your training schedule like and do you match your training with your cycle? I don't match my training with my cycle. Oh, but I don't do look down. <laughs> it's so interesting because I literally just listened to a podcast before coming here about cortisol and starting to well, see you said that your training. Well, you said yeah. when you came in that you've um, taken this week off training because you've noticed your cortisol. Yes. It's not like you push yourself, you know? No, yeah. I just, I've had a very stressful last six months and... You know, the body is meant to, if, if, you, if you're relatively quote unquote healthy, um, your body is meant to be able to handle a decent amount of stress, right? If you've got a good stress response. But if you have stress for a prolonged period of time, it really starts showing 
up and it started really showing up in my physical body at the moment. Uh, what exp- What were you experiencing? Oh, like, I mean... First of all, like my resting heart rate, right, is through the roof. Are you a Whoop girl or an Aura? I'm an Apple girl. Oh, oh does that Apple Watch show that stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. amazing. So, so the new ones like measures your temperature, that's so it can track your cycle more oh, accurately. Oh, amazing. And as well, yeah. I mean, Apple sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that um, sleep, waking up consistently at 3 a.m., <gasps> can't get back to sleep. Well, that's again. when you know your mind is just exactly. racing. And that's like another thing of. Um, I mean, I haven't, I actually haven't told, I was thinking about this actually driving up because I was wondering if we're going to get into this point. I've not told anyone this other than obviously my friends and my family yeah, knows, yeah, yeah. but I've not spoken about it publicly before. But a few years ago, I got diagnosed with ADHD finally. And when I'm really stressed and I don't manage my stress, my ADHD gets really bad. Mm. And I think I'm not your, um, standard outwardly a ADHD person I have no issue keeping a conversation looking you in the eyes I'm not sitting and like twitching and can't sit still and so on my ADHD is internally yeah. my head never stops the chattering it's like I've got five squirrels in my head like I heard someone saying on a podcast it's just it's never ending well your start of your meditation journey would have been very difficult yeah (laughs) it was very hard and my meditations are also harder when I am quite stressed uh, because I'm trying to manage like a few different things so that is my ADHD then wakes me up early in the morning at three literally I wake up because my brain is just going so what do you do I get up. Oh. I know it's terrible and don't recommend this at all. <laughs> don't get up at that time. That's always too early. Like, I feel like if it hits 4.30, yeah. okay. Yeah. But 3, it's like I know. still night. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely it is and it's terrible. Um, so, yeah, then I'll get up and like probably just start working or something and I'll do my meditation in the morning and then I'll either go to the gym or just go for a walk depending on like how much sleep I've kind of gotten through. I feel like I'd need five meals if I was up that early because I feel like <laughs> I'd have breakfast at like six and then I'd be hungry again yeah. at nine. Like, it's a very long day, I tell you long. that. It's a really long day. Do you go to bed early? In the early-ish, I, tr- I try to kind of be in bed by... I want to say like lights out around like 9.30-ish. Mm. Um, it does take me a bit to fall asleep again. Um, I've also never been a good sleeper. Yeah, Ever in my entire life yeah. since I was a child. I have to work really hard on my sleep. Uh, no matter how healthy I am, I have I have very specific <laughs> routines around same. my sleep and everything as well. And everything has to be like aligned for me to have like a really decent sleep. But to be back to like the cortisol kind of thing, it's, yeah. So there's just a lot of physical kind of, things that are showing up now but also mentally right like I'm very exhausted as well the mental kind of I can feel that my mood is not as great as it is I'm finding it harder to kind of manage my mood and be upbeat and stuff like that and I usually consider myself to be quite like a happy person as well and um yeah it's it's just getting a bit harder so I need I know that I need to take it a bit more seriously and start to lower my stress um, but so with my training, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not adjusting it to my cycle, although I do need to start doing that. Yeah. I think it's actually something that I really want to try to see if it'll be beneficial for me, which I'm sure that it will. But and I feel like it's really becoming a big topic of conversation. Yeah. And I think gyms and trainers are going to start learning more and then facilitate schedules to meet women's requirements because we're just so different to men oh absolutely like i mean we run in a completely different cycle than what they do but no one told us this until recently (laughs) well that's because the world is built on like like, it's a man's world it's a man's world (laughs) yeah and we're just like trying to fit into it but yeah i try to train like monday to friday sometimes saturday so i do train five she goes hard this girl I lift a lot. Yeah. I might be little. She's but strong. I've seen her. I'm like, what? So I have a PT uh, and I'm seeing what you're like. I mean, I can't even do a chin up. <laughs> that took me like a while, but also because I used to play elite level sports. You've got that. Growing up, you. I've got a very competitive um, gene to me. <laughs> and I'm not competing against anyone else. I'll be everyone else's biggest supporter. I'm competing against myself at all times. Absolutely. But I do love to push myself because what I've loved at 98 when I started was that, well, first of all, like my body changed completely because I built so much muscle. Um, but also it really, really built my mental capacity of 
sitting, learning to sit through discomfort and pain. I love that. So like much. if someone places you on an erg for like 30 minutes and they're like, you're not dropping below this. What's and an we've erg? Got, sorry, an erg is like... <laughs> An erg is either a rower, a skier, oh, like a bike. My back literally just bikers. like got sore. So I'm picturing that <laughs> movement. But if someone's telling you like you're not moving from that, you're keeping it at this level, you're rowing at that level because we obviously do, we're constantly chasing numbers, right, of improvement to have hold a certain standard. And if someone's telling you that and you're not getting on and you have this competitive gene, I'm like, I'm going to do this because... I'm telling myself I'm going to do with it. And one thing that I've also had to teach myself is that you've got to be able to keep your word to yourself because if you don't do that, it like I'm such a big believer in that um, actions over words. And so if, I'm tell, if I tell myself I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, you know. And, of course, there's, you know, um, there's levels of that sometimes of being more kind to yourself. That's not what I'm saying at all, but... It's just really shown me how mentally strong I am and how little credit I give myself sometimes of what I can actually endure and push through. And so I know that I speak about this in a mental capacity, but I've taken that and incorporated into my emotional and my kind of spiritual life of this stuff that I've been going through with my body or like my eating or anything else and been like, you can sit through these, this emotional discomfort, like there is an end to it you have proven to yourself that you're strong enough, like there's also an end to this if you just sit through it, right? So I'm incorporating the things that I'm learning on a physical level into my mental life as well. And yeah. that's been such a game changer for me. So it's, and it's just honestly been such a community down at 98. It, I started there after coming out of my last relationship. And again, it just, it just was such a container for me to feel safe in when I was processing everything else and it was my one constant that I knew that I went down to that made me feel good I connected with people I connected with myself and it was just it's just been great I love it yeah, yeah. I mean the wellness space when you're with the right people yeah it's incredible it really and is, very yeah. welcoming and I always tell people when they're starting their health and fitness journey is you're about to meet some of the most welcoming kindest people because yeah. of the spaces you're going to enter exactly I wanted to touch. Are you still doing yoga at all? I am. I because you were like headstanding, like you did all the crazy stuff. Yeah, and I love doing that. Um, well, I guess that's competitiveness in you. Yeah, it's I like I can do all the hard shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I still do yoga, but not very often, though. I have to say, I do yoga more in summer because I'll take my mat down to the south drain and I'll do my own self-practice, which I love to flow. So it's that meditation normally, as it well. It is, you know? yeah. It used to be kind of a bit of a Sunday routine for me, that which is it still is, but now in winter probably not as much. But my Sunday routine very much is as I wake up and until 10 a.m., I don't see anyone. I, I'm not reachable. It's me time where I'll journal, I'll go down to the beach, I'll have a swim, I'll meditate, I'll flow, um, that's like just me time. It's, it's not negotiable at all. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one time a week that I just have to myself that I'm Because you're reachable. always walking with friends. I, I know. And, know I love... and I'm always by myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to be like a solo walker as well because I would listen to a podcast. But again, like I walked with friends this morning and I was speaking to my girlfriend about it when one of our other girlfriends walked off and she said, it's so nice that I've started joining you girls walking in the morning because it just, I know that I need to make time for it. And that's the thing. It's look, I sometimes get pushbacks when I do my day in a life. Right. And I will have some people saying this is so unattainable and it's not. And this is where I kind of like, I want to be careful about what I say, but it is attainable. I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary. And granted, I'm saying this, I know I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. I only have myself to look after. However, I also work for myself and I've worked for myself for the last seven and a half years. At no point in time have I slept in and I get out of bed at nine, roll down for coffee, start work at 12. I don't. I get up consistently. My routine is waking up at 5 a.m., to do all of these things such as meditate, do my skincare, train, go for a walk after, have a coffee and be home, showered, changed, ready to sit at my laptop at 8.30, very latest at 9, which is a standard office time for people to get into. So I just think it comes down to 
How much do you want it? And what are you willing to sacrifice for the period, the teething period that's going to hurt for you to get to where you want to be and for that to become your new norm? Because we all, I get it. It's hard to start new things. It's hard to start new routines until it literally becomes a routine that you just kind of do. But I set time aside to do these things because it makes me feel good, right? And I know that it positively impacts my mental health so much. It's because I also work for myself. I spend a lot of time by myself. I love my own company, Mm. probably a bit too much sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, I feel the same. (laughs) So for me, it's that one thing. It's like I train, I get to walk with my best friends in the morning and catch up with them at Bondi, watching the sunrise, being outside in nature, regulating my circadian rhythm, like it just sets me up. It makes me feel good. When I don't do it, I feel off. Yeah. Because it stimulates it. Like it creates oxytocin, like all of these great things. Like we're hugging, we're embracing each other. We, there's love between us. It's it's nice to feel connected. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And as I said, doing that walk club, it completely changed my perspective because I didn't even realise I walked because it was so fun just chatting to everyone. Yeah. But usually on my podcast I'm like, oh, should I walk to Tama? Should I, should I actually yeah. keep going? Should I go to Bronte? Yeah. There's a bit more head noise. I do feel like you're a bit more in your head sometimes, which can, but you know, there's space for both, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on where you are in your life and yeah. what you need. I think mixing it up and my good friends as well know that I'm in a stage in my life where I don't party, I don't really go yeah, out. Same. So if you want to see me, it's like a walk, matcha, <laughs> healthy lunch day. Yeah. Don't dare ask me to go for dinner at 8 p.m. Absolutely yeah. not. Um, so I think it's a really good way to socialise. And yeah. again and again, the guests always say walking, non-negotiable. Yeah. It, it really there's just is. so many good things to it, right? Again, and that's why I've been doing it the last few days about taking a break from the gym. It's, you know, it's calming. It's grounding. It's outside in nature. You and get it's been sun, beautiful weather. It's regulating. It's yeah. It's, you know, it's lowering your cortisol. It's just, it's so many good things. Like I think walking is highly underrated yeah absolutely yeah i wanted to touch on detoxing Mm. i do see you do the saunas you do the lymphatic massages two questions Mm -hmm. what do you do what's detoxing processes in your life and secondly if someone's new to detoxing they don't want to break the bank what can they do yeah so i want to preface this first with that I feel like there's a bit of a war going on sometimes on social media uh, between practitioners such as, you know, whether you're a naturopath or a dietitian or dietist or whatever it is, and um, they might be, and some people speaking about how you can detox and then some people say, you don't need to detox, you've got a liver and it's doing it for you and you've got organs that are detoxing your bodies, that's what why they're there, so you don't need to detox. So I think reframing the word of like, it's not about going on a crazy like juice cleanse for a month to no, detox. Yeah. It's not actually about the detoxing word itself. I think it's about supporting the organs that are helping your body naturally opening the detox pathways so that it can do its job, right? But with the lifestyle that we're having and the world that we live in now, most people have got a level of inflammation. Most people need to take better care of their health to support those organs so that they don't, so that it can get rid of the inflammation, the high cortisol, like all of these things, right? So I think for me, when I try to support those detox pathways, you know, I'm doing, I try to do like a lymphatic drainage massage, like once a week, at least every two weeks. Um, I do infrared saunas. And when I'm in the saunas, well, I do body brushing and I do gua sha to help like move up. I open up my detox pathways first by doing like the tapping around like the different areas so they can actually drain as well. Do you have videos of this on your socials? Okay, I need to watch. (laughs) I need to watch because I just go in the sauna and like listen to a podcast or read my book. But yeah. I could be habit stacking that one. Yeah. I think it's like the one thing that I figured out with infrared saunas for me depends on what I need in the moment, right? Sometimes I go in there, I just need to listen to a podcast or I need to read my book and just fully chill out and not do anything. If I'm doing a sauna in the morning or midday and I know that I've got meetings in the afternoon or I've got something that I need to have more energy for... I'll do body brushing because it stimulates your blood flow and it really spikes your heart rate as well, but in a really nice invigorating way. And so it kind of gives you a really natural like energy burst, kind of if you're doing like an ice bath, but just opposite with the heat. Um, So there's different methods. I think I've kind of started incorporating like a 
bit of the different things when I'm in a sauna just to figure out what my body needs in the moment. And I really love that you can encourage different feelings for your body. Um, what else? What, what was the, what was the original talk. question actually? <laughs> We've gone off God, topic. This is a long, long story long. We love saunas. Like me we and love Caroline saunas. love saunas. Love saunas. Um, with detoxing, what yeah. could we do if we're new to detoxing that doesn't yes. break the bank? Because lymphatic massages and saunas, yeah. it, it is expensive. And Absolutely. I think for a majority of the listeners, they might not be able to commit to that. Yeah. What can we do from home, I yes. guess? So instead of doing it in the sauna, get a dry body brush. You can get one for ten dollars, maybe if a really good one, twenty dollars. It's not expensive. It'll last you for a good year if you clean it, maybe two years. Um, so that's about doing long strokes right from the bottom. Before you start doing the strokes on your body, you want to open up these uh, detox pathways that I'm talking about. So you've got different detox pathways areas where your lymph strain in your body. So in here, on your wrist, in your armpits on your um, collarbones here, behind your knees, on your ankles. You can look this, you can Google, it's pretty easy. You wanna tap those like a few times on like, massage them so they actually open up. And then you wanna start doing like the long strokes towards those drainage points. So that's something you can do at home. It's really good to do, even if you can do it once a day. I know most people might not be able to commit to that I want to do it, but it is really good. Even before at nighttime, before you do like a shower, it's gonna enhance like your, um, detoxification process but it's also going to give you great skin because it enhances like the blood flow you're going to feel great after it it's really such a great tool um other detox things to do um at home let me have a think what else do i do actually at home like i mean i also love doing like gua sha right like on the face and stuff like that as well um what else do i do for like detox have you seen is there do anything, through, anything through anything um, through diet like hydration yeah, or different sorry. vegetables or yeah no absolutely um, so again you obviously want to support like your liver and all of those organs that are kind of in charge of those things as well so I take I mean I take a lot of supplements yeah okay <laughs> and what do you take because I'm oh I've God, got like not, four not, and not then, enough time well I take magnesium yes. zinc fish oil, yeah. um, a probiotic, yeah, and then I take Beauty Chef Glow and yeah. antioxidant and collagen and then... <laughs> I take four. <laughs> oh, yeah, but then the pa- uh, four capsules <laughs> and then a bunch of powders. Yeah, no, totally. God, I have very... So this is like another thing. I'm, I'm super nerdy when it comes to health. Like I love diving in and this is the work that I've done over the last over decade now. I have a lot of great friends that have become mentors that are very amazing biohackers and like really into new modern science, right? And really supporting your body. So I love when I have conversations with them weekly about what I can do to support my body. Um, I think also the autoimmune, having that uh, makes you really focus on that biohacking. Yeah. And it really kind of- does. And it makes a big difference. So I got different kind of supplement protocols depending on where I'm at during the month, you know, and how I support. So that's probably one of the things that I do. I know that I support myself with my supplementation uh, based also on my cycle. So I know that when I'm, for example, coming into about to ha- end my cycle and like start a new cycle, so having my period is that I, uh, my histamine response is really bad. So that's also one of the reasons why I'm not sleeping really well. So supporting my histamine response so that I can actually sleep better is really important for me. And when I don't do it, I sleep even worse. So that's some of the things that I'm like trying to support as well, right? And like you're saying as well, I do need supplements to support my autoimmune diseases. And I'm not on, I'm on a very, I've got Crohn's disease and I'm on a very, very, very low dose of um, anti-inflammatories. And even my gastroenterologist was like, I have never seen a person be able to be on such a small dose with what you have. And I said, it's the peptides. Yeah. Peptides are really great. BPC-157 is it's so powerful in terms of increasing like your cell turnover and just being super anti-inflammatory like it is just incredible it keeps my Crohn's fully managed and like in remission and I've been out of it for like the last 
four weeks now and I feel it. I feel it a lot. It's, um, yeah, it impacts me so much because I am a firm believer of that everything originates from the gut. And so if that is unhealthy, it doesn't matter how much you try to fix the issue if you're not getting to the root issue or like the, the bottom of sorry let me say that again it doesn't matter how much you try the, to fix the top funnel right like you got to go to the bottom and yeah. actually figure out what the issue is and it always originates in the gut, in the gut. Yeah. yeah I feel like that is said again and again it is, um, yeah. which is why I've started taking the supplements and yeah. things and also learning that our food isn't the same as it, what it used to be. And yeah. even if you're eating a healthy diet, you might be, not be getting the nutrients. Yeah. It's just, there is so much in the wellness space and it can be so overwhelming. And yeah. I think it's important that we bank the win. And what's amazing is that you've been able to keep these diagnoses at bay mm. with supplements and, yeah. um, your healthy lifestyle. So yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to hear. I wanted to touch on social media. Yeah. As I said, you are so inspiring and a great Thank person you. to follow. What are some ways that the community can kind of better their social media experience to kind of help with that? The negative self-talk that happens to a lot of us mm. from those apps. Yeah. I think it's so important to, not follow people that makes you feel like you're less than or that you're not good enough in who you are because even though we can all and I think we all should strive to be better human beings not and I don't say better as in the exterior as in looks and like all these things but like actually being a better human being than yesterday so I mean being more kind being more compassionate being more patient, like being kind to others around us. Don't ever let anyone feel like you're not good enough as you are today, right? Anyone that makes you feel like you need to look a certain way or live a certain lifestyle to be worthy, I think you need to remove those people from your following list. Um, and then I think it's also just really cutting through the noise of like there is so much like negativity on social media and to be fair like there are quite a lot of days that it's that are increasingly becoming I'm becoming more aware of where I'm thinking god the more I feel like I'm doing my work with myself and the more I kind of tap into the part that I that I believe in that we all come from which is pure love which is pure energy right of trying to be more compassionate and not dive into the ego-led kind of like behaviours and belief and everything, the more I just feel really disheartened by social media and how people tear each other down and can be really, really nasty. Um, I think there's a space and place for everyone and everyone has got the right to be who they are as long as it doesn't directly like hurt someone else. And so... I think what really bothers me about social media is how some people feel the need to express their view on someone to their, well, I would say face, but it's not really because I don't actually think that these people, if they met them on the street, would go and say that to their face. And it just makes me really sad because I'm like, yeah, I don't agree on everything that's out there. It doesn't trigger me though and I don't really have like it doesn't trigger me to the point where I feel the need to like tear someone down I just move on or I just unfollow that person you know so I think it is really important to protect your peace and your energy as well and if you consistently feel triggered by someone maybe also use it if, if you feel really confused about why you're feeling heavy or triggered by seeing someone that you're following doing X, Y, and Z or whatever it is, maybe also inquire, like inquire within yourself of why is this triggering me? And if it's continuously triggering you, you know, unfollow them and then sit with that question. What is it about this? Because I think when we do have triggers, they're always there to not just in a way of stuff that can be healed or things that we need to look at. So it's on good and bad, um, the social media sometimes, right? Yeah, I really like the idea of asking yourself why. I haven't yeah. thought of that. I've always just like blocked or 
unfollowed people that trigger me yeah. but I haven't actually sat back and thought why yeah um is it because there's an ego part I'm seeing them doing something that I want to do yeah. is that something I need to work on and understand there's enough enough success for everyone or yeah. is it purely just because I find that person rude yeah and I don't like their content yeah. it's two different ends of the spectrum and yeah that self-discovery and awareness is so important yeah. so I think that's great great advice I always end the podcast with the same question, which is what advice would you give your younger self? Mm. It would probably be something along the lines of it's okay to feel different. It's your uniqueness. You don't need to dole that for other people just to fit in and also god it's a lot of different things i had a pretty like my childhood has like imprinted a lot on me that i've had to like work through but it probably would also be you know people committed to misunderstanding you consistently isn't an invitation for you to work harder or change yourself for them to love you it's more of an invitation to walk away and realise that those people aren't for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. And just embrace yourself. It's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much for jumping on the pod. You, you are such a ray of light. <laughs> thank you. Honestly glowing. <laughs> so if you don't follow Caroline, make sure you follow her at Caroline Groth on Instagram. She posts the best recipes. I love all your day on the plates. So, yeah, a great spot to get inspired if you love this pod make sure to share it on your socials and tag us it truly truly means the world when i see you guys showing me where you're listening to the podcast um so with that i will see you on the next episode Bye.